Welcome back to The Extract. I'm Kyle Meyer, and next to me, for better or worse, believe it or not, the future of South African wine. Ooh. How's that? Is that a little pressure? It's laying it on a little thick, I think. A little heavy, a little heavy <laughs> yeah, for you? Uh, a little heavy for you? Oh, sweating. Sweating. Yeah. <laughs> We got any Kleenex? I think I'm going to have a little cry. <laughs> Kids, uh, um, uh, be advised. Uh, things in South Africa are changing. Hmm. They're changing quickly, yeah. and they're changing substantially for the better. Uh, this is an area of the world where we all jumped in in the early '90s, uh, post-apartheid, uh, when the wall came down, etc. And what we found out when we jumped in was like it was just a, a, a bucket of thorns. Oh, the attack of the jumping choyas. Wow, that is, uh, everybody wants to come and pull them out and you're like, hang on a minute, this hurts. And um, it was a little scary at the start. I, I was fortunate, or unfortunate, how you want to look at it, to sell some of those early wines that first came to the States. Uh -huh. um, so we were right there at the cusp at the start and it was kind of like, whoa, okay, things are a little mm, behind. Uh, there and it, we over a period of time things slowly progressed slowly over a decade and then what happened is we had this essentially this explosion of new thinking new minds fresh faces people wanting to change the status quo people saying why can't you do this why can't you do this and next to me is one of the uh, front runners Chris Alheit welcome sir thank you kindly thanks for having me yeah it's this great is, to be here this is friggin cool dude thanks, um, man. Uh, Chris's wine uh, the cartology is one of the wines we've been worshiping here uh, at WineX for the last year or two uh, since we first tasted it and had our minds blown. All right, I'm seeing a lot of different things on the backs of the bottles, okay? Now, traditionally, South Africa was like, there was this place called Stellenbosch, right? And we uh -huh. also had the nice pictures of the craggy ranges and shit like that. <laughs> now, you, you guys are spreading your wings a little bit, hmm. okay? You're doing something a little different. So, yeah. so talk about this whole process of like, if Stellenbosch is out there, what else is out there? Yeah. Look, I mean, that's that. That kind of thought process has been been at the heart of uh, of what's changing in the Cape. We've uh, we've rediscovered stuff that we forgot about for a long time. I mean, uh, one of the uh, one of the advantages of the cooperative system was that uh, grapes were planted all over the place, really far and wide. Uh, and I mean, 18% of our national vineyard is is Shinnan, which is one of our heritage grapes. So. A little bit of searching, a little bit of driving around and knocking on doors. Um, a lady like uh, Rosa Krier, if you're a wine geek who likes South Africa, you've probably heard her name before. She went on like a three or four year quest just to unearth uh, what we had. Uh, and we, we're still discovering stuff. We're still finding crusty old vineyards out in the mountains that everybody forgot about that are just going to the cooperative year after year and disappearing into anonymous splints in, uh, in big tanks. Yeah. So there's a, a sort of the liberation of the countryside in some ways, you know, from a, yeah, from anonymity mostly, mm. and uh, also from getting pulled out. You know, older vineyards are getting less and less viable. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you talk about forgotten, were these vineyard were these vineyards really ever remembered, or from the start, were these were these vineyards making like you know three dollar wine and send, being sent off to distillation? Was there a time when these vineyards were revered within South Africa, or is it only just recently in the last you know decade? Is like Oh my God! What is this? How far back can I go? Yeah, well, back to the, what, the 1600s, 1700s. <laughs> yeah, no, we were to a ten-minute yeah. show. Mm. No, but you, but you know what I'm saying. I understand the question. Uh, look, most of the um, most of the stuff that that uh, we now use for cartology and even for the single vineyards, at some point in its life, probably was in a bag and box. That's yeah. that's the hard truth, you know. Some things outlast the summer. Like the Seagram's Golden Wine Cooler. Anything else? Be patient. That's it, you know, we, we're embracing that. Um, so a lot of the Shannon, um, or a lot of the, the old heritage stuff was planted for cooperative use and probably no, it was probably not revered. You yeah, know? Yeah. There may have been some parcels that, that, that cooperative winemakers discovered were, were really good. Right. Um, I wish I could. I wish I could give you a, mm. a, a you know, you know, because a more articulate us, answer. But I, could, no, we never. We did. We didn't recognize any of these like crews or right. fantastic vineyards the way they have in Europe and celebrated them and separated them out. And right. not really. No. Yeah, because for us pre 1990s, when we first had our first snapshot of, of, of South African African wine or what we perceived as South African wine, um, you know, we, we we don't know if it was a situation where you know it was all about Cabernet and Chardonnay prior. Hmm. To the to to the to the wall coming down to the gates opening up, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we don't have that perspective here. <clears throat> mm. And and what's really fascinating is if if these were forgotten at the start, and then forgotten in the middle, and basically almost ripped out, right? 
I mean, how, yeah. how many of these vineyards were literally in danger of just getting tractored? Well, half of that one's been pulled out. That one was going to get pulled out the year that we started with it. And um, yeah, look, it's, it, it, you know, the farmers are in a corner, you know, because they just yeah. weren't making money out of the grapes. So yeah. it's, uh, it's just the macroeconomic picture didn't really, didn't really work. Um, yeah. So what's the discussion like when you knock on this guy's door and say, hey, I'll give you this if you do this? Like, was he like, uh, yeah. Look, every, <laughs> sort of, you know, we, we joined, we joined the, the, for lack of a better term, probably the race for, for uh, these old vineyard resources relatively uh, kind of in the middle, you know, it, it had already been happening. But when we, when we started knocking on doors for old vineyard Shannon, it was still, you know, it was available. It was around, people were getting quite poor prices. So, um, you know, it was, it was easier to do, to do deals with farmers and, 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 and give them, make the, the vineyards profitable. But um, one of the big positives of, of what's happening in the Cape now is that there's quite a it's like a scramble for these resources, which mm. is fantastic. So, Old Vineyard Shannon is is uh, viewed in a much more positive light. Where before it was kind of a pestilence, you know, <laughs> and uh, and now we've uh, we've suddenly woken up and realised that wow, look, we've actually got something that has got quite a unique South African identity, and and that's you know that's the key word in the whole thing is identity, mm. um, and this this Cape Cape wine revolution that you've been talking about, which is. Yeah. Um, I would say it kind of started in the Swartland and been spreading throughout the Cape is uh, identity. It's, it's, it's not just about how the rest of the world views us, it's about how we, how we view ourselves, you know, <laughs> and uh, how we embrace the things that are right under our noses. We've got really beautiful heritage stuff there, you know, grapes that have been in South Africa for 350 years and there's no need to pretend that we live in other countries. Or, <laughs> <laughs> no. There's no need to, yeah. to, to imagine that we live somewhere else if, if what we have is, is quite beautiful already. I, mean, I can't even remember your question. I just yeah, no, 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 but the point is, <laughs> but no, you answered it. The, yeah. the, you know, the point is literally like Burgundy one day sitting there going like, yeah, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, not interesting. Hey, I heard Merlot's hot, right? Mm. I mean, that's almost kind of the deal, but they didn't even know that they were Burgundy at the time. When you talk about identity, mm. we got the wines in front of us. We're going crazy for these wines. Thank you. What, what is the identity at this juncture? What makes mm. these wines so unique and special? Um... You see, the Cape's been making wine for quite a long time. A lot of people don't know that. Um, we've had uh, we've had an industry since 1656. Uh, the first five grapes, apparently, according to the literature that we've got, um, that arrived back then, were Chenin Blanc, Semillon, Pontac, which is kind of an obscure red, uh, Palomino, and Muscat. I'm not sure which one of the Muscats, but Muscat. Um, so those are kind of the heritage grapes. And when I talk about identity, I mean, we're talking about making wine 80 to 100 years um, prior to the draining of the swamp that became the Medoc, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and before Cabernet Sauvignon was, was migrated down from the Loire and, and was planted there. So, and I mean, how heavily associated is, is, is that with Bordeaux, you know, mm -hmm. as, as an identity, as a, as a grape. So um, we've got every reason to kind of to, to claim this stuff as, as, as identity, as much as California can claim Old Zin or Old Petit Syrah or, you know, Argentina can claim Malbec um, as part of its identity, it's, I think it's absolutely imperative that we that we that we claim Shannon and, and Old Semyon and and the stuff that's been around with us, you know, since the outset of winemaking in the Cape, as a as a as a part of our identity, and that we we kind of plant the flag there, you know, right. and say this is what we do, this is what we've been doing for ages, and we do it well, you know. And the whole idea behind our business and behind um, a lot of the young wine businesses in the Cape right now is trying to make wines that can't be copied or repeated in other parts of the world. It's a, it's a complete antithesis to, you know, looking at what's going on in the rest of the world and trying to copy that in yep. the Cape, you know, it just that doesn't make any sense. Mm. So what most of the youngsters are doing now is just really trying to do stuff that cannot be emulated anywhere else. Yeah, that's yep. the idea. Yeah. Now, and when we talk about not being emulated, you know, the, the style here to me is, is, is so unique. It, it's, it's, it's something wonderful and different because you have Chenin Blanc, it's a great variety that we you know we know the Loire Valley, right? Makes pretty impressive stuff. Outside of the Loire <coughs> Valley, most people look at Shannon like <laughs> bag and box. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the approach that But 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 little do they know that Shannon makes some of the most compelling, you know, flexible wines in the world mm. with regards to stylistic, you know, bent. So stylistically these wines, where do they fit in? I mean are, are yeah. they are they lean wines? Are they dry wines? Are they tart wines? Are they full wines? Are they heavy wines? Are they yeah. How would, you, how would you interpret the, the new, the new you know, Cape wine style for these grape varieties? It's a, it's a fantastic question, and I think it's a... And you have two minutes. Great, that's... that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's a question that the Cape is, is also wrestling with at the moment, um, what to do and, and how, to, how to present Shannon to the world. 
I've got a very specific personal view on that, and mm -hmm. I'm not trying to disrespect any of the other Cape Shannon producers. There's some wonderful stuff out there, but uh, you know how you how you make wine has to be dictated by the climate. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just no way around it, you know. Um, so Chenin Blanc in the Loire or Mosel Riesling, residual sugar is appropriate to balance the intense natural acids that you get in those places. And let's not forget that Chenin also grows in the Mediterranean. I mean, there's Chenin in Terras de Larzac, there's Chenin mm -hmm. around the Mediterranean basin. It is a grape that's, that's relatively flexible, it can grow in a lot of places. So what South Africa is sitting with, you know, and there are degrees of this, we've got a lot of variation, we've got much cooler sites and much warmer sites, different winds, different rainfall patterns, different soils. But by and large, we're a Mediterranean climate. We're a warm Mediterranean climate. So, you know, you do, it's not rocket surgery. <laughs> you know, we need to make we need to make dry wines. Yeah. Basically, I think, I think we need to make brisk, you know, relatively powerful dry wines. I'm not saying ripe. Mm. I don't think we need to be picking over ripe in a sunny climate like South Africa. It's way too easy to make a sunshine bomb to try to impress people. But um, you know, if you pick at the right moment, you can find that bright natural acidity with everything good that sunshine can give you. Mm. Uh, and I think that, for me, that's the style we need to chase. We need to make, you know, powerful dry wines, but like I say on our website, they need to be like a gymnast, mm. not like a sumo wrestler. Yeah. You know? They yeah. need to be li <laughs> light on their feet, but right. with plenty of punch. Yeah. No, basically we were talking about it earlier. It's about having your cake and eating it too. Um, to me, these wines just exhibit richness and definition and focus and complexity and nerve and character. I, 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 th I think what's pretty shocking about these wines is the completeness of these wines. Where usually when you, when you talk about Germany, you talk, you know, all these areas are known for one particular style or another. Here, you know, that you take the chameleon-esque aspect of Shannon, the fact that it can do everything, mm. and you kind of smush it all into one palette and drop it in the bottle. And, and to me, that's the coolest <laughs> in the world, man. Thanks. Because, because, no, no, th seriously. Um, it, it's, these are pretty exciting. In case you didn't notice, we're, we're pretty jazzed about them. And you know, the thing is, they're, they're not cheap. We can talk about the economics. But the fact of the matter is, these guys get less grapes. Mm -hmm. Chris harvests a tenth the grapes from his vineyard sites that you would for a Napa Valley Cabernet. Say, I mean, like ridiculous. The yields are, are comical. Yeah, very low. From yeah, from severely old vines. These are treasures. There's not a lot of them. And if you get the opportunity, if you see any of these on a shelf, uh, it's an immediate buy. I, I can't think of any more unique white wines being produced in the world right now than what's happening down in, uh, in South Africa. I don't mean to make your head so big. I want to make sure you get through the door when you leave today. Yeah, I've been but... struggling with my ego as it is, you know? <laughs> I just told you who I thought I was. A god. I just told you. That's who I think I am. <laughs> but, um, my gosh, you guys are... Thanks for having the balls to do this and come well, up with something really compelling and exciting for the new world and, uh, and yeah. for white wine in the future, so... Thank you. Well, thanks for having us Cheers. and thanks for, like, you know being open-minded enough to look at South Africa through a new lens, you know, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Game on! <laughs> <laughs>